Then is the lion. Lion chop. Well, all four of these are ventriloquist dummies who, with a bit of help from their friends, have delighted radio and television audiences over the past 30 years. But it might surprise many of you to learn that ventriloquism goes back no less than 3,000 years. Despite the antiquity of the art, no one had published a book on its history until today. This lavishly illustrated volume, called I Can See Your Lips Moving, is the work of the ventriloquist Valentine Vox. Glenn Worsnip went to the Museum of Childhood at Bethnal Green to meet him. Here we are at the Bethnal Green Museum of Childhood, where we're looking at an exhibition of uh, ventriloquist uh, dummies. What are you looking at me for? Well, you're a dummy, aren't you? Oh, come on, cut that out. Valentine Vox is the one on the right, and he's not a dummy. His history of ventriloquism took 15 years to write and required in-depth historical research into learned sources ranging from the works of Sophocles to the Radio Times. I mean, they're going to sit there and watch. What of course they're going to watch. That's the whole point of doing it. Mr. Vox is a professional, a vent, as they say in show business. And as well as this, his latest dummy, George, has a collection of 200 others, many of which are part of an exhibition opening today to coincide with the publication of the book. The Bethnal Green Museum of Childhood is, of course, already a treasure house of non-ventriloquial dolls and dolls' houses. Beautifully and elaborately modelled as only the Victorians knew how, as well as other favourite toys, ancient and modern. Oh, I have that one. It's broken now. Oh. Today's children no doubt still dream of becoming fighter pilots or even engine drivers, but Valentine Vox has other ideas for them. Well, the purpose of this exhibition really is, um, is the first exhibition on ventriloquism covering a period of about 3,000 years. So this is the first time that uh, the ventriloquist figure, for instance, has been displayed at such a mass and all the, the printed matter with it, there's engravings, playbills, books, ephemera, memorabilia pertaining to the art of ventriloquism. So I'm hoping that when people come along and see this that there'll be a lot of inspired youngsters who will want to become ventriloquists. But before your child is talked into ventriloquism, remember this. It is a wickedness lurking in the human belly and deserving to dwell in a cesspool, an impure breath which some people, on account of their overwhelming pity, call ventriloquism. So said Photius, patriarch of Constantinople in 850 AD, and the wickedness lingers on. In the 30s, Mrs. Herbert Dexter sued for divorce, citing as co-respondent her husband's walking, talking, if not living, doll, Charlie. She won. I think that the ventriloquist draws a very thin line between illusion and reality. He's creating the illusion that his, his dummy, sorry, figure is real. And there have been incidents, for, in, for instance, there have been instances, for instance, um, there was a famous ventriloquist called Jimmy Nelson, and uh, he performs in the States. And he actually sings a, a song using three different voices. And then he got to the last line of the song, and he opened the dummy's mouth, and he expected the dummy to finish the song. So there's a... <laughs> he really believed yeah. that it could operate on its That's own. That's right. And, of course, the famous story about Arthur Prince, who was actually buried with his dummy when he died. So that was, that was kind of eerie, really. They look very unpleasant uh, close-up. Uh, what are they made of and how do they work? Well, they work by a series of uh, strings here, which in turn are attached to springs inside the head that pull the various mechanisms. It's very complicated type movement as you see this. It's fully That's animated. So the ventriloquist's finger, or four or five fingers must be moving all the time. That's right, yeah. These are, this, this is the, uh, the stereotype, the very traditional type of mm. ventriloquial head. In fact, this was made about 20 years ago. Whatever happened to this business then of throwing the voice? Why isn't that an act anymore, of making the voice appear from other, other places? I, well, I think it's because the figure, the, the ventriloquist figure, has become the focal point of the act now. You see, at one time, ventriloquists merely used to go out and throw their voices, you know, upstairs or downstairs or in, in a trunk or somewhere or in, even in a telephone. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we're just doing the program now. Okay, goodbye. Was that for me? No, I don't think so. So, so you, are, you are nonetheless trained to do that, even yeah. though you don't do it in your act? Yeah, most ventriloquists do a little bit of what we call distant voice work, where you get the expression actually throwing the voice. Where do you train? 
Well, ventriloquism is really a self-taught art. I think most ventriloquists, most professional ventriloquists, have taught themselves. But uh, the only school I know of now is uh, there's a school in Japan, actually, and there's a, a Reverend Noda there who teaches. And a Reverend about... Noda? Noda, yeah. Ichiro Noda, his name is. And he's a Reverend. Oh, sure. All right, listen up. Yeah, he's a Reverend during the day, and he does the ventriloquism as well, and he seems to combine the two, and he has a, a school of over 2,000 members. But there's nothing like that in, in, in this country? No. Oh, uh, excuse me. Yes? That was really boring, boring. Uh, we're going to go back to the uh, studio now. Glenn Wersnip.